Hello everyone and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. My name is Mark Richards and in this lesson number 204 we'll take a look at risk storming for architects. A risk storming is a technique where we can collaboratively identify and look for risk within an architecture. Now in prior lessons, specifically lessons 127, 128, and 129, uh, I took a look and described aspects of assessing architectural risk. And as a matter of fact, this particular lesson, number 204, uh, really pertains to lesson 128 on identifying architectural risk. What I'm going to show you is a technique called risk storming that allows us to identify risk. A couple of resources you can get more information on risk storming. The first, is uh, Simon Brown's book, Software Architecture for Developers, where he describes this technique of risk storming. And also we dedicated a chapter in our Fundamentals of Software Architecture book about risk storming as well. When we take a look at assessing or identifying risk within an architecture, uh, the context of risk storming really falls into the identification of that risk. Uh, recalling back to lesson 128, uh, what we did in that lesson was we saw how to assign risk to various areas of a system based on criteria, uh, specifically architectural characteristics. But I posed the question in lesson 128, how do we identify this risk. And I showed you one area or one aspect technique of doing that. And that was through this matrix uh, where we take a look at the overall impact of the risk crossed with the likelihood and rate these low, medium, or high, and then multiply each of the grids to get a numerical analysis. In other words, uh, one to two is low, three to four is medium, and six to nine is a high risk. What I want to show you is this technique of risk storming uh, where we can better reduce the level of subjectivity uh, when we're assessing risk within an architecture. Uh, risk storming starts with an architecture, either a new or proposed architecture, or even an existing architecture that is undergoing change. And the idea of risk storming is that it is a two-part process. Uh, phase one is really an individual phase uh, where the team that is doing the risk storming analyzes the architecture individually. And they start, <clears throat> without any discussions between them, looking for risk areas using that matrix to identify one to two, which would be low risk, which would be green, three to four, medium risk, which would be yellow, and then six to nine, which would be high risk in terms of being red. Now, phase one, this individual phase, is usually done a day or two ahead of the risk storming session. This is a critical phase. And the reason is that if we were all just to get together and start looking for risk, somebody might point to, let's say, a, a database or one area of the architecture and everybody's eye moves over to that area. And so the purpose of this individual phase is so that we're not, or any of the team members, aren't swayed or redirected away from areas of the architecture where they, where they might, in fact, see risk. Well, <clears throat> once that phase one ends, everybody gets together. And these teams are usually constructed of anywhere from Oh, three to six people, including, by the way, um, the architect who, of course, was, is in charge of the architecture. Um, it might include other architects, uh, certain stakeholders, maybe from operations, maybe from infrastructure, maybe from data, and also developers as well. <clears throat> and that's, um, that's an important piece that I've discovered is a win-win situation in risk storming. Uh, developers sometimes see areas that we don't see as architects that might be risk. And also, it gets the developer involved in the architecture and helps get that buy-in. Okay, 
When phase two starts, we all get together. Risk storming sessions usually take on average around an hour or so. And everybody gets together and starts putting yellow or red or green post-it notes with the number on it of where they found areas of risk. And, and the team members all do this together, just kind of put all the, the areas of risk found. And you can see that this particular architecture, it's not important what the architecture is, has some areas of risk. Well, what we're trying to do in phase two, the collaborative phase, is to look for consensus within the risk areas. And we can see already we have consensus. Um, everybody thought that, or three people at least, thought that the squid proxy servers were high risk. The push expansion servers over here uh, were medium risk. And finally, low risk over in the Memcache and Cassandra area. So since we all agreed, we're effectively done with those areas. The real purpose of the second phase of risk storming is really to have discussions to convince others to be able to arrive at a single solution. Uh, so for example, we see that two people thought the elastic load balancers were medium risk. One person said hi. One person thought the PPNS servers were high risk and somebody thought Redis was risk. Well, let's take a look at each of these and see how risk storming works. So the idea is we start to tackle the areas where we disagree. <clears throat> and we might say something like this. All right, who put the red uh, nine there for high risk? And somebody says, I did. Why'd you put red? Well, listen, if we, if we lose those, expand, or those elastic load balancers, uh, there's no access into the system. Uh, that's pretty high risk. Well, says the other two team members, oh, we do agree that the overall impact of the risk is definitely high. But let us show you some metrics because we gathered some information, historical information, and we can demonstrate that those elastic load balancers have, well, as far as we have tracking, never gone down. So that means the likelihood of that risk occurring is low. That's why we put it at a medium, number three. And that's how this graph or this matrix actually works. It's impact over likelihood. So the person who put red there said, oh, okay, well, in that case, I agree with you. Um, it is high impact, but I see that it's pretty low risk from a likelihood. So we'll put that at a medium and we all agree. And that's kind of the process of risk storming. Now there's two other aspects that I want to show you that happen in risk storming. Uh, the first, um, somebody put uh, a high on PPNS servers. Well, who did that? Well, I did. Well, why did you put a high there? Listen, on the last product I worked on, we had to interface with those PPNS servers and it was our biggest headache. They were always unavailable. We had to do so many workarounds with those. Oh, well, I'm glad we had you on our risk storming session. You see, getting other architects' perspectives as opposed to just our experiences uh, gives the capability of identifying risk where we would not have seen that risk before. So we all agree, oh, okay, that's high risk. But then we see this one. Who put high risk for our Redis cache? And somebody says, um, I did. As a matter of fact, it was one of the developers. It's like, well, why did you put high risk? And the developer says, what's Redis? This is one of the reasons to include developers in your architecture risk storming. You see, as the architect, I made the assumption that all the development teams were well experienced in Redis. And here, one of the developers that will be working on this hasn't even used Redis, doesn't know what it is. So unidentified or unproven technologies or even unknown technologies automatically get a high rating. And this use of risk storming eventually identifies risk areas across all of the areas, the context across the criteria, eventually filling in uh, this entire risk matrix I, I showed you in lesson 128. Well, <clears throat> that was the kind of very quick tour of risk storming, but there's one other thing I want to show you just as a pro tip. And that is 
try to limit your risk storming sessions to a single criteria or a single context area. Uh, for example, maybe after a lot of changes, we say, um, we're going to do a risk assessment based on availability across all the areas of the system. Or you may say, today we're going to do a, a risk storming for all of these categories in test taking. And so this kind of, uh, by criteria, by context, is a smart way of reducing the scope of these risk storming sessions. And by the way, another pro tip, this is not a one-time activity. Uh, this happens periodically through the creation or migration of an architecture. Uh, but as an architecture undergoes change or the technology undergoes change, or maybe it's the environment or the business, uh, risk storming up efforts uh, help collaboratively identify risk areas within the architecture. So this has been a follow-up to lesson 128, which is lesson 204, risk storming for architects. Um, please stay tuned in one more month because I am now doing a one-month cadence. Uh, the first Monday of every month is a new lesson in Software Architecture Monday. So I will see you then.